Well hello people, so it's Peter here, down in the old man shed. <laughs> of course I am, you know, where else would I be? <laughs> yeah, the old man shed, you know it. Um, just uh, catching up with you all, letting you know what's been going on. Uh, two things have happened since the last video. Uh, now, what I do when I come down like today to play trains, it's a lovely day, it's some, some midday Sunday, gorgeous weather. So it's a pleasure to be down in the old man shed. And then whilst I'm running some trains for my own pleasure, then I'll get the old camera out and uh, you know make some running clips to stick on the end of this sort of, uh, of the video. As you know, I always stick some videos on the end. And it was when I was doing that, that I encountered my first problem, um, which was a uh, overload on the system. Right, I had my two Class 67s going around. I've got two Ormby Class 67s. One's in EWS livery, the other one's in DB Schenker Red. And because they are 67s, uh, I, I think I'm right as regards you don't see a 67 pulling freight. Um, the, although I believe the engine is the same as in a Class 66, the, it's geared differently to give it a higher top speed. So therefore, it's the ideal candidate powerful train to um, pull um, passenger stock you know coaches carriages whatever so uh, on the odd occasions I do get me 67s running they're top and tailing a network rail um, train you know coaches so um, it looks apart then so I never have it pulling uh, any freight or anything so it was whilst doing that that I got the system overload on, on the uh, on the layer you know so everything came to halt and it, and uh, the uh, power supply's got the warning uh, bleeper in it and that was going 10 to the dozen. Looked on the gauge master face, it says system overload. So turn the power off quick as quick as you like. Um, and yes, there's just normally about 16 locos on the layout at any one time. So being DCC, they're all there alive as such, waiting for their command. But I actually only had the two 67s going around and nothing else was done to the layout. But nevertheless, system overload. Oh, what's gone wrong here? Uh, I had taken the two locos off, put one loco back on, put the power supply back, all hunky-dory, no problem. And that loco responded all right, you know. Took that one off, put the other 67 back on, oh, system overload. Well, I thought, oh, blimey. So, obviously in my mind I'm thinking, something's happening with the chip or something right to cause a short I've had it in the past so I took the body off took the chip out and it's a TTS decoder in it and put the loco back on the track uh, without any chip or anything in it and uh, no system overload so that's good and uh, it just so happens I've got another little 8 pin decoder I've got this it, it came in a second-hand loco that I got, so that was a little bonus to find it had a little... No, I might, I might have got it from uh, the model train, my model train club, to be honest, in the, in the loco that I might have got from there. It had a, it had a you know, this, this chicken. So I don't know what make it is, but it's an eight-pinner. So I'll put this in to the Hornby, put it back on the track. All right, no problem, no overload. Obviously, uh, dialed in the number, active, you know, moved the train and the train was all right but it did seem to take a lot of power before the train started to move the engine started to move and I, I, I at first I put it down to this this chip is not you know being configured properly or anything so anyway I just thought to myself oh you know that it doesn't seem to be running that well then I had uh, the brainwave and I don't know why it didn't why it took me so long on the layout, protecting the layout, I've got the DCC Concepts Alpha Meter, so that lets you know how much uh, power that the, you know all your locos and your layout is taking. It comes out; it's a 17 volt power supply, and then obviously you read out the amps. I mean, I've got two trains running around now without sound on, admittedly, but and it's it's not even coming up to half an amp of usage. So what I had the idea was is I I put um, this is the Class 67 in question. It's all fixed now. But I put the other one on, the DB Schenker on, which I knew was fine, no problems with it whatsoever. Operated it, took a, took a look at the uh, alpha meter to see what it was reading, and it was still, you know, less than half an amp with, it, with this one, going, you know, with the other one going around. 
thought, okay, so that's the ballpark figure, that's, that's what I'm aiming at. Put this one on with uh, this little decoder in it, because I didn't have a TTS, another TTS for it yet. Put this one on, and whoa, the, uh, the, uh, the power thing went up to one amp, and it was, it was increasing, getting you know, over one amp, just running this low code. So I thought, ah, oh, well, that's what blew the chip. There's something wrong with the motor, and it's drawing so much power. You know, the TTS uh, Hornby chip is, uh, you know, it hasn't got a huge uh, potential to take uh, power from it. So um, it has to have a single iPhone speaker in the uh, fuel tank. You can't have a double iPhone. It hasn't got the power to take it. So obviously something overwhelmed the chip and blew the chip. So I knew, well, I mean, I knew that's what it was. So I got on to Peter's spares on the internet, ordered a new motor, didn't muck around, think, well, you know, what else can it be? Got the new motor a day. I mean, they're, they're brilliant Peter spares. The postage is so incredible. You know, you order it one day, it's arriving the next. New motor arrived and uh, where is the motor? This is the old one now I've taken out. Very straightforward to take this little bugger out and put the new one in. You've got your little uh, universal joints that obviously click on and the universal joints they're on a um, an extendable bar you know so um, it's very easy to put this in place you know you can put it in place and then connect the uh, universal couplings to it afterwards all right so quite straightforward new motor in the uh, loco again with the little chip again put it back on the track ran that perfect less than half an amp power usage just like the other 67 with a TTS chip so I thought, yes it was the motor why don't know it, you know it was going around as I said I'd, I'd filmed it and I'll put the film clip on after me finishing chatting to your ear I filmed it and then all of a sudden whilst I was working on my workbench you know as I say the uh, you know the, the system went off and the alarm bells were going on the uh, power supply system overload so yeah I didn't do absolutely nothing she was running around for quite a while and just just like that some something's given trouble with the motor and that's it new motor so uh, because uh, you know there's nothing you can do I mean you can take well if you take the weights off and then take the motor apart uh, brushes normally I mean although the brushes you can't replace the brushes that's the thing with these I mean Graham Fuston is got his Ren locos running around Lakeside, and they're what 30, 40 year old uh, locos. They're all totally serviceable because everything is replaceable on them. You know, if the brushes wear out, you get new brushes. You know, you remagnetize the magnet on them, and they just keep on going. These, I have to sort of say that it's a bit worrying to know that anything that we're buying that's modern outline, that's produced today, is all fitted with these sort of things. You've got nothing, you, all you can do is buy a new motor for as long as they're available. So whether or not our locos of today will be around like Graham's Wren locos in 40 years time, I don't know. I think the Lima ones and the old Hornby ones with the pancake motors, you know, the very simple motors, again, they're, they're getting long in the tooth, but again, it's still, still serviceable. So they'll keep going. It's, it's our new super duper detailed ones that we probably might have trouble with. Anyway, might not be a problem for me, might it? <laughs> I won't worry about that. It'd be whoever uh, has been, you know, my, my collection after me, I guess. Anyway, so yeah, new motor, put it in. Now, trouble is, TTS decoder. It's a Hornby, isn't it? And you know what Hornby like? Yes, they produced them, and for a while there's plenty available, and then all of a sudden they disappear, and I can't get hold of a TTS. 67 sound decoder for love nor money went on in the internet did all searches da, 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 you know. so i put out a help in my um facebook online forums uh, model modern train modern rail network and uh, model imaging network whatever all the forums that i belong with and put a shout out said anyone got a 67 for sale and uh, lo and behold <laughs> i got replied back from uh, my chairman from our model railway club greg and he said pete i've got one he says it's second hand because it's been in the you know the logo but i've taken it out 
to put a Lego Man Biffo version in the 67. So it says there's nothing wrong with it. Obviously the wires are clipped just like this because the speakers are in the uh, fuel tank. So you've got to cut the wires. It says, but you know, when I last checked it, when I took it out, it was all working fine. So you're welcome to have that. Thanks, Greg, you're a lifesaver. Sure enough, picked it up on the Thursday night, club night. Put back in the old loco, soldered up the wires for the speaker. Sweet as all, you know, back to normal running. So uh, that was that. And um, I guess that's really uh, something I want to sort of, uh, sort of say in this video is that it's, it's very handy being a member of a railway club because of the help that you get, you know? I know we can go online and ask people this, that and the other, but you know, it's, 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 you can't be actually dealing with someone face to face who you know and all the rest of it, and if he says he can do something for you, you know they'll do it. So my model railway club, and the big shout out to them, is the Beckenham and West Wickham model railway club. And Greg, his name's Greg Marshall, he is the chairman of our club, right? So he came to me rescue. And uh, Greg, as you I might think I may have told you before, not only is our chairman and so therefore helps with the uh, construction of layouts at our model railway club's building, he also builds his own exhibition layouts. So he's got a YouTube channel called um, Ebsworth Street and if you go over to that and have a look at that, in his last series of films you see he's building his new exhibition layout called Gordon's Lane. And Gordon's Lane we had uh, a few weeks back up and running in the club uh, hall because it was going to an exhibition and he needed to give it a shakedown and make sure that everything was running right because he can't get it's a huge layer <laughs> needless to say he can't get it all out at, at home he hasn't got the space so the only place we can put it together is in our uh, club nights in the in the, uh, the church hall where we gather so we had it all out and we had just a couple of trains running around just to check it and I've took a video of that so I'm putting that on here so you'll see he's super detailed it's a lovely what I my ideal layout it's nice and simple two line two main line running tra uh, tracks with the third rail he's put the third rail on them he's got uh, some interest in the very front of the layout he's got a uh, a little engine shed for a railhead treatment train, you know, that those little things that uh, clean the tracks and things. So he's got that as a little bit of interest in the front. But primarily, it's two mainline tracks. And there's no curves, right? Where the, the, there's no corners on it. The curves are after the scenic breaks at each end. So all you're seeing are the two nice, not, they're not dead straight, obviously there's slight mirandry, but Basically, you see trains going past that speed, which looks fantastic, to be honest. And then they go, after the scenic break, as you'll see on the video, round into, a, I think it's a 12-lane fiddle yard. So, when you're on the exhibition, he had loads of uh, stock on there, you know, freight, passenger, and just with the you know points activating at each end, he could get another train out running this way. So it was, it was great, no messing around trains running at their speed on the main line look apart the they're nice and long bit, bit like the Pete Waterman one all right so you could really you know you, you had a long time to watch a train going down because it's uh, 30 foot long I don't know it could be wrong might be wrong with that <laughs> but uh, it's bloody long anyway so Greg helped me out with a chip so that was fantastic and then I was able to help Greg out now, as you know with my layout, I've been putting these end of train lamps on everything I can do. And I have got three Class 37s on here under the Rail Operators Group, or one that says Europhoenix still, it's not been changed. And if you know what they do in real life, they pull passenger stock around, you know, delivering them to all over the country or taking them off the scrap and this, that and the other. So when you've got uh, one of those trains, You've got to, they're not going to be powered because it's getting pulled by the 37. So there's one, this is a, what's this one? This is a 1811. Sorry, excuse me. Yeah, this one, this is a 158 class. And it's got the old lamp iron there to take the end of train lamp, right? Because that won't have any, been, any power whilst it's getting pulled behind the 37. So it must have an end of train lamp on there, an end lamp. Greg wants to do the same. But he's got as a, 
a DMU or an EMU, a 166 in Network Southeast. So I guess that's an EMU. And he said, can you do us a favour, Pete? Could, could you put an end lamp on one of that? So I can then have a drag. You know, I'll sort out the rest of it, take out the gubbins, you know, the motors and the rest. He said, but if you, if you just put the end of train lamp in it, um, I can make a drag for my layout, maybe Gordon's Lane, Ebsler Street, or wherever he wants to use it. So I said, yeah, no problem. Now, I didn't know what 166 was, to be honest. Then, then we looked it up, and um, it's one of those, uh, you know, it is an EMU, but at the end, it's all like glass fibre bodywork and everything. I don't think you even see buffers. It's all encased. And I, I was looking at it and I thought to myself, why am I going to put this lamp? Because, uh, you know, all, all this glass fibre work was shrouding the front of the loco. And I thought to myself, there's, there's no lamp iron to put the lamp on. So I thought, oh, OK, no worries. I'll stick the lamp like I've seen in the past, where they stick them inside behind the windscreen on the, on the dashboard, you know? If they haven't bothered to put them on, if there's no way. Anyway, so Greg put the model in, get it out, and I think to myself, that's not going to work because the um, the windscreen is in a deep blue tinted plastic you know glazing and you couldn't see through it. Never mind about any cab detail, you can't see the cab because the uh, the blue plastic is so dense you can't see inside. So I said, Greg, I said you're not going to be able to see see the lamp flashing through this plastic. It's so dense. So we said, well, well, you know what? What the hell? How do we do this? Because. It, you must be able to put an end lamp on a train, right? It's, you must be able to. And so we're chatting away at the club, got the model in the end, and uh, while we're chatting away, Nathan, one of the other uh, members, comes over, and Nathan actually works, you know, for British, well, British Rail, whoever, but he works on the railways, all right? Let's put it that way. I don't know what company he works for. And he, he works on the railways, repairing EMUs, DMUs, whatever it is, you know, in his, in, in, in his um, engineering works, you know. So that's what he does. And he sort of said, oh, that type of uh, train, more often than not, will probably have a pull-out lamp iron. So he said, a pull-out lamp iron? So he says, yeah, you know, so near where the coupler is, there will be, uh, you know, literally you can get in there and you will pull out this device and it turns out to be the, the lamp iron that you put the end of train lamp on. So it's normally right nearly by the coupling because everything else is bodywork. There's nowhere else to put it. So I thought, right, okay, well, we did have a little look online, but we couldn't actually find any good enough pictures of a 166 to definitely confirm that. But I take, uh, you know, take Nathan's word for that. That's what they do. And we found some other uh, classes that did the same. And yet they were right by the delay, uh, Delna coupling or the tight lock coupling there was you know this lamp so I thought right that's what we're going to do with the 166 so I did that for um, Greg it absolutely looks fantastic and um, I put a little video on that on here working again so Greg's now got that as absolutely easy job to do because the 166 was a, a powered um, train it did have pickups and so therefore those pickups I was able to use uh, to power the uh, end of train lamp, you know, the little PCB board, which didn't have to drill any holes. It was great. Just took the took the thing apart, took the took the uh, it seating area off, and then the little chip went in underneath there, and all the white. Oh, brilliant! So he can, within minutes, if he wanted these 166 back to uh, being a proper train, he he can put it back because I've not destroyed anything. I've just had to solder two wires to the pickups. So he has, you know, and so if he wanted to just cut those two wires, plug back in the little tail lamps because they're a plug job, so unplug it so they don't work, plug it back in again so they will work again, so great. So that is it people, alright, so uh, yeah, two things, so the 67 is up and running now, so that was a little hiccup, um, and uh, I've done the work for Greg, um, but as I say, uh, Model Railway Club, it's a good thing, you know, to belong to. Um, I'll get fun from it, you know, we're all, we have a good old laugh on a Thursday night when we get together, not always talking trains, talking about life in general, trying to fix the world, obviously, but uh, more than not, often than not, yeah, it's, it's trains, and we've got a double O gauge layer on the go at the moment, an N gauge layer on the go, and, a, and, a, and an O gauge layer, alright, we do the, all the, the, 
there's like three sections of the of the club working on those scales, and our own uh, the club layout, similar to Greg's, is really just a very long uh, main lines. With, it's called um, what's it called? Hold up, let's have a look at it. Make sure I get the name right. It's called. I wrote it down. Uh, the West Exchange sidings. All right. So there's four tracks two main line so there's always something running past the, the uh, observer in the front of the layer at exhibitions there'll always be trains running on those two lines because they won't be stopping but the other two line, lines we can sort of stop and start because it is a an exchange side and it's where you know they change drivers and things like that so so once again nice nice and long just the curves you know the track curving around at the very end but predominantly uh, I haven't got a video of that on straight, but if you go onto our website, uh, the Beckenham West Wigan Model Railway Club, um, on Facebook, you will see on club nights when we got that layout on the go. It's, it's under construction, tracks are all down, but it needs you know a lot of work to be done on it yet, signaling and the points electrified and everything, yeah. And then the final, we've got some buildings and stuff like that on there, but the final scenic stuff is not done. Whereas Greg's one he's done he's done everything it's um apart from the rolling stock everything is stuck onto the layer which is quite great so easy set up you know all the figures all the cars all the built you know there's no, there's nothing i don't think there's anything that comes off so all he has to do is put the rolling stock on and it's super detailed with greg you know you just look at it if you look in the um, the rail treatment uh, train shed you know you can see all the shelving, all the bits and pieces that he's got in there. I'll try to get in there. And the signal box has been fully detailed out. Oh, yeah, brilliant. All right, so um, have a little look. But that's it, so um, thanks for looking in. Um, I'll, as I say, gonna put some running clips on now of of the trains running before I had the, uh, the hiccup with the 67. You'll see that running around. And there's even, a, I've even got the steam running, all right. <laughs> You have to be quick though. Um, but yeah, so otherwise. Now, before I go, can you give me a bit of advice as regards my channel name here on YouTube? As you know, it's Peter Dixon, right? Because I started the channel before getting into uh, the, the layout side of things. So I would like to rename it Torridon Road, you know, after, which is what the layout, well, I call the layout instead of my own name. But my worry is that if I change the name of the channel, does that mean I lose all you people? Because I, I don't know, I've never done it before. And uh, so I'm loath to do it. So can you, you know, give me some uh, words of advice and let me know uh, if that's possible to do. All right, so that'd be a great help. Thanks guys. And then you might find that one day the channel's name has changed to Torridon Road after the layer. That's it. Or as, uh, let's see, John Crooks, a subscriber or follower he, he wants me he says why don't you call it poms p-o-m-s and, and he, then he classic clarified it peter's old man shed all right so <laughs> so it might be poms no. honestly john no <laughs> i like the idea it reminds me of my working career I, i've worked in the company as a, a lab technician in a photo in for photo box you no know, photo box and moon peak well I was an engineer working for that company and the operating system that we all use to put the orders through you know all your prints and things like that it was, it was a photographic company you know we, we put printed everything on anything and um, so our operating system was called POMS all right John so that's it but in that but POMS there stood for photo box operating uh, order management system photo box order management system all right POMS all right, so when you came up with saying, call your layout Poms, I thought, I, you know, retired from there a couple of years back now, and I thought to myself, Poms, 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 sounds familiar. Oh, Christ, my old job. So, yeah, there we are. Okay, that's it. I'm going to put some uh, clips on. Uh, that's it again for checking in on you and letting you know what's going on. The layout itself is running fine. The power supply system did well. Um, I'll show you the alpha meter before I go into the clips and uh, you'll see what I mean about 
how much power it draws, which is next to nothing, all right? So it's a, it's a good thing to have on your, your layer, okay? Okay then, guys. All right, so bye for now. You take care. Thanks for tuning in, and catch you next time. Bye. Right, okay, we'll have a little quick look. So I've got two trains running. They've got their lights on, but they haven't got their sands on. And at the moment, with those two trains actually running, there's another 14 locos on the layer, you know, all here in front of you, in the engine sheds and everything. So under DCC, they're all there waiting for their signal so they can move or whatever. So they're all alive, and I think I've got uh, seven uh, buffer stop lights. So that's what takes power from the power supplies. Now I'm going to drop you down. So here is the alpha meter. There we are. So it's a 17, uh, what are we talking about? Volts, over 17 volts power supply. So it's not a 12 volt power supply, it's more, well over that. And at the moment, those two trains running around, uh, less than half an amp in usage. 0.47, might go up to 448. I'm gonna put the sand on, the two locos, and you'll see it goes up. So that's one. That's two. So now it's gone up to just over half an amp, or about half an amp average. Yeah, it fluctuates to below and just above half an amp. All right, so that's why when with the 67, this thing went up to over one amp, just for that one loco that was running around, I knew it was the low, you know, the motor had gone wrong. When the new motor went back in, it's running around the same as this. Turn the sounds off again, sorry. So that's where this little device came in very handy. It let me know what was going on with the power supply. And, uh, you know, had I, had I actually observed it a bit more than what I did, I might have seen the 67, the, uh, the power fluctuating on that motor before it actually blew the processor, because this is what it's there for, you know? The TTS obviously can't take a lot of power. Um, you know, uh, overload or whatever, so it, it, the chip gave up the ghost. Okay, thanks people, that's it. Running clips to follow, uh, Greg's layout, Greg's 166, and then running clips. All right, thanks guys, bye for now, bye bye.
the inside, so the front face.